Well, you've already seen the preview. Here it goes. This is me. That's my Twitter icon. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm off to a great start already, guys. This is me. That's my Twitter icon. Prerequisite. Drink all the booze. We did it. <laughs> oh, so this is SE me, SE you, hack all the humans. I'm Leonard, I work for Verizon Business, professional services security consultant. This stuff really doesn't matter. That doesn't tell you who I am. That's nothing. A little over three years ago, I wasn't too happy with the way things were going in my life. I was pretty much unhappy all the time, cranky. Nobody really wanted to be around me. And I was looking for a way to get out of that because I didn't like being around me either. Luckily, somebody that's uh, sitting in the audience started the SE, the social-engineer.org podcast. Did I get it right, Chris? You did. Thank you. <laughs> And uh, that started leading me into the way to figure out where things were going and getting me information as well as finding more and more with everything that they had. I'm going to talk a little bit about the basics. Now one of the things that I ran with was if you think about something that makes you angry, you get angrier. And if you're always looking at the <coughs> negative, Everything's always negative. Those people that are negative, you know them. They're the person you say, hey, how's today going? Well, you know what? I'm just waiting for it to happen. I know it's going to happen. Something's just going to come along to ruin my day. Take the person that's positive. Hey, how's things going? Ah, oh, you know, I had a flat tire on the way to work, but, you know, I was a little bit running a little bit late, but I'm here. Everything's going great. That could be the same person. It's all about the attitude. Now, we all know that we've been civilized forever. I mean, I grew up with a house that had toilet, running water. I'm sure everybody here did. Anybody that didn't? Okay. <laughs> now, but if you really look at it, just taking a look at how long humans have been on this world and how long we've had civilization, it's been about, a, and you compare that in a year timeline, we've had civilization for about a month. How much do you think that's actually changed us? Not at all. For one thing, we have our emotions, which a lot of people don't give a lot of credulence to, but emotions are pretty much the bios of the humans, basic input-output system. They're the things that we key on, the things that have kept us alive and dealing with things. Now, everybody here at least one point in time has been afraid of a snake or a spider or some sort of bug. Why does that matter? Well, if you're out there and you've never seen that snake, bug, or whatever, you don't know whether it might be a danger to you. If it's a black widow and you go playing with it, that's not going to be good. If it's a rattlesnake, it's not going to be good. So, innately, we have fear of them. You grow up, you see a daddy long legs, most of us aren't going to care. Garter snake, most of us aren't going to care. Now, everybody knows fight or flight. The reality is there's three stages. The first is freezing. When something catches you unawares, you're fr and you've never dealt with that situation before, you're going to freeze. And the reason you freeze is if there's a predator out there, if you stop moving, there's a good chance that that predator, if he has not already seen you, is going to move on. Because we're drawn to motion. <coughs> now, if that didn't work, you're going to want to get the hell out of there because they got big teeth. So your next reaction is going to be to run, to take flight. Unless you can't, then you have to fall to the third option, which is fight for your life. Now, this freeze, until I understood this, I was a young child. 
eh, about 12 or so. And I was there, my aunt slipped and fell down some steps off a porch. And I froze. And for years, I felt horrible because I could have just reached out and grabbed her, but I didn't. That was because this is the first time I'd ever been in that situation. I didn't know what to do. I froze. Now, I've seen this situation happen since then, you know, but I'm not pushing people off porches. <laughs> and I don't freeze anymore. Somebody starts to go down, I grab for them. That's just the way we, we work. Now, I got up and down. Those are really basic key concepts. Up is positive. Down is negative. If you're feeling sad, you might kind of be standing with your shoulders down, your head down, and everybody instantly knows you're not feeling the greatest. But if you're happy and things are going, you're going to be going out there. Victory, you got your arms up, thumbs up. Those are all positive upward things. So, if you're trying to change your attitude, when you find yourself doing this, stand up straight, get your head up. What do they tell you? Chin up. <coughs> Things will look up in the future. So you can hack yourself by catching when you're doing these negative things and doing something that's positive. Now obviously this does not happen overnight. We all live in a society dealing with feedback. You walk into a room and your friend is not feeling good, is kind of down, slumped shoulders, you're immediately going to react to them and you're going to take on some of those characteristics yourself. And when you do that, your change in your body posture will actually affect you chemically. You'll start feeling a little bit like them. That is empathy. And the way, you, you, the way your body is affects the way your mind feels. And it goes both ways. <coughs> so, I alluded to this, you know, you got to build your character. Everybody here doesn't want to be somebody else. Well, let's hope nobody here wants to be somebody else. But the question is, do you want to be the best you you can be? Do you want to get your point across? Do you want to go into a meeting with something that needs to get done and spend 45 minutes trying to convince the people in the meeting that you know what you're talking about? Because if you're coming in, you're just looking down, and you're like, well, I really don't know what's going on here, and you give negative, negative vibes and negative emotions, you've got to overcome that before they're going to listen to you unless they already know you and unless they already consider you a expert or somebody very <coughs> knowledgeable on that subject. Because I don't want to go into a meeting and try to convince somebody I know what I'm talking about and waste the entire meeting doing that instead of getting down and getting figured out what needs to be done and moving forward. So, who are you? You know, I've lived with myself my whole life. I obviously know what I'm like. Yeah, you know, a stupid question, right? Well, the other question here is, how do other people perceive you? And there are ways to, besides listening to what people tell you, you can do different types of personality tests. I took the Briggs-Myers test many, many years ago. And it said I was intuitive. And I looked at him and said, this test is wrong. I'm not this intuitive. I go through things logically, step by step by step by step. But I started thinking about things that I did and trying to figure out how I could possibly have this come up. <coughs> I realized that I would start working my way through steps and then something would click and I know, well, and I would actually jump multiple steps 
because something clicked and I knew that this is where I had to go. This isn't magic. This is your subconscious, which processes information different than your conscious. It will pick up on things that you don't consciously. And if you are in tune with that and listen to it, it can help you get things done faster. You can go, oh, wow. Uh, there's a book called Blink. In it, it talks about how if you're very good at what you do, such as a doctor walking through a hospital, stops at a patient and says, this patient has this problem wrong with them, you need to go check them for this and this and fix it. That, pa that doctor saw the signs and had been doing it long enough that their subconscious kicked in and said, hey, this is what this person needs. Another example from that same book, a museum bought an artifact. They had it checked and they were certain this was an authentic artifact. But at the same time, everybody's initial reaction when they saw that artifact was like, no, no, that, that, that's not authentic. But all the testing that they did showed it was authentic until eventually they realized it was not authentic. These people, these experts, were not able to initially figure out what was wrong that made it be inauthentic, but the things didn't add up in their subconscious. Now another test, the disc, your dominance, influential, conscious, or steady. Oh, before I move on, I'm also an introvert. And I am an introvert. <coughs> when I took the disc, I pretty much pegged the dominance. Now, dominant introvert doesn't sound logical to me. But at the same time, there's many times in my life I've been called pushy, <coughs> overbearing, stubborn, always stubborn. But that's just me. And by looking at the results and kind of looking at myself, I got a better idea of who I actually was. Because you know, it's, it's like when you live in a city. How many people who live in New York actually go to the Statue of Liberty? From what I understand, unless you were, if you were born there, basically less than 1%. Don't quote me on that. This is a guess. But anybody who goes to visit there wants to go to the Statue of Liberty. We're used to ourselves, but we may not really understand ourselves. Now, your subconscious, which I've talked about. First impressions. They don't happen up here. They happen in your subconscious. <coughs> and when there's a first impression of you, that is what you have to live with for a period of time. If they get the wrong first impression, now this guy doesn't know what he's talking about, or anything like that, you are going to have to spend time getting over that first impression because it's not conscious. It's not the brain up here saying, oh, this dude's lazy, he doesn't know what he's talking about. It's your subconscious coloring how you're looking at them. And if you give the wrong first impression, you're going to be fighting an uphill battle. Now, the different components that you're going to be dealing with, your attire, what you're wearing. Don't remember what the TV show is, but there's some show where the CEO will go in and work at different low-level jobs in the company. It's like undercover CEO or something like that. Yeah, and even though that person's picture has been plastered all over the place, none of the employees recognize him because he's not walking in in a business suit all dressed up. He might be walking in in jeans or a janitor's uniform. And that attire does not match a CEO. So if you're coming in and you're trying to get a point across to the business, showing up in your hacker shirt is usually not going to get the business to listen to you. Because you're just some techie guy. 
What do you know about business? Your stature. I mentioned this before, up. You walk in positive, they're going to assume that you know something. They may not agree with everything you say, but you're going to have the opportunity to discuss it. And going back to first impressions, if you're going for a job interview, or if you're going in to see the executives, make sure that you've got the right stature before they can see you. You're going in for a job interview, don't be walking in from that parking lot like this. Get out, stand up straight, walk in confident. Because that's your first impression. Personality. If you're kind of boring and you know there's just really nothing about you that is, you know, they're going to have a hard time dealing with you. If you can, walk in with a smile. Because if you're smiling, you're more likable. And, you know, the, in, the amount of energy you show. If you're kind of walking slow and hesitant, you're not giving the right impression. You want to walk confident. But at the same time, you don't want to be running it. Well, if you're late, yeah, you probably want to be running it. But you shouldn't be late to begin with. And also, you got to be steady and calm. I'm going to put this down for a minute. Because if you're walking in saying, guys, you know what, we've got to do this and get me more. And, and, and. People aren't going to be comfortable with you. Because you're being spastic. Nobody's comfortable around that. Am I going to run into one of you guys? Am I going to trip over your feet? Am I going to get the point across? Are you going to be trying to figure out where I'm going and why I'm bouncing around? So. Uh, now, no matter what you do, you're going to end up with negotiations. I don't care whether you're walking in looking for a raise, you want a new job, and you're going in and you're interviewing, or if you got a project that you want to get done, or something crashed and the system's a mess and you've got to clean it up, and you've got to negotiate how that's going to be done. Yes, Chris, you told me I could use this. You want to pwn the frame. You want to own the situation as much as you can. Your initial presentation, your first impression, is going to start setting the frame for what's going on. You're going to want to do some planning and have some strategy. If this is a job interview or going for a raise, what are you worth to them? What are you bringing to the table and how much is that worth to them? If you're out there sweeping the floor as a janitor, I don't think you're going to get $100,000. But you need to know what you're worth to them and be able to present things to show how you're giving value or how you may give value if you're going to go work for them. When you, when you want to be prepared for what I call an opening bid and a minimum, if you need $65,000 and you go in there and you tell them you want $65,000 and they're going to want to get a deal, maybe they only want to pay $60. they are going to try to talk you down to $60. If you need $65 to live or, you're, or the position's worth $65 and you go and you ask for $70, you might get $68. You might get 65, might not actually be worth that 65 to them. But nobody likes, everybody likes to get a deal. But you gotta, you gotta be realistic, so don't ever start with your minimum. Especially, I've seen many people walk in and say, oh, or and I talk to them, they say, Oh, I asked for 65 and they shook my hand. I'm really happy. They would have paid more. But you didn't know that. 
what does the person or the people you're talking to want? You could have this fantastic idea that's just going to make them tons of money if they do it. At least you believe so. <clears throat> but that's not the direction they want to take the company in. They're not going to be interested in that idea. No, we don't want to do that. That's not part of our strategic direction. So you're going to tank yourself if you're not aware of what they want, at least to some level. You know, with what you're going to give them, what's that worth to them? You know, going back to the worth. Why would they not want to do what you're proposing? Because if you understand things that they don't want and they might not want. Oh, well, you know, that's kind of expensive. What kind of response are you going to give them? You've got to have an idea of what these negatives are going to be. Going back to the frame, you want to be presenting this, you want to be kind of framing things. You want to be talking about things in a positive way. You don't want to say, you know, well, I, I know this didn't work before, but you know, if we do it this way this time, well, you just presented, yeah, the last time we did it, it didn't work. Well, I, you know, I know that if we do it this way this time, these are the results that are going to come out. <coughs> Pretty much saying the same thing, but the first thing I said brought back the negative connotations of what failed. You know, and what is your opening? How are you going to start this out? What is, what is that, what you want to get out there front and center? And then I'm going to flip back. I talk about a theme here. You cannot put together a logic tree that is going to be, I say this, they say that. I say this, if they say that, I'm going here. If they say this, I go here. Because I don't know anyone that's smart enough to put together a logic tree that somebody won't bust out of. And then your script just failed you. You can have snippets. If this goes wrong, or if they ask this question, how am I going to respond to it? But you cannot script an entire conversation. Because you'll never know what they're going to do. tactics, what to do when you're going in. It's a little bit repetitive. Your approach, your first impression. How are you dressing? Where, where are you going? Are you going to the executive offices? You want to be relaxed. You want to have a calm presence. You want to be perceived as a person that they want to talk to. Everything is dynamic. You don't know what's going to happen. You've got to be prepared to be relaxed and roll with it. Opening. Your opening. You got, I'm getting redundant here. Sorry about that. This million dollar price tag. It's been proven psychologically. Even if you throw out a number that's insane, that will actually move their value up a certain level. Say, you know, well, you know, I'd really like to get a million dollars for this, but you know what? We both know that's crazy. But you will actually push up the amount that they will end up being willing to pay. How much depends on a lot of different factors. This was also kind of targeted more towards if somebody's interviewing, uh, like I said, the opening bid, and if you're going someplace, you want to look at the total package, because it's not only what they pay you, it's what benefits you get and what those benefits cost you. Your paid time off, or, or not getting paid time off, especially if you're dealing in a contract house situation, they might say, well, we'll pay you this much while you're working, but you don't get any paid time off. Or you might not get paid time off for the first year or for the first six months. If you're not getting what you're looking at money-wise, and even if you are getting a nice number for the money, what are the other benefits out there and what can you do? You have your pay. Nowadays, nobody's getting signing bonuses that I know about. 
that's a thing of the past, at least for now. But your paid time off. How much paid time off do you get? And when do you get it? Uh, you know what? I'd really love to start for you, but I got, I'm taking a week's vacation next month, and it's already scheduled. I can't get out of it. And it's going to be really difficult for me to end up taking a week off unpaid when I just start a new job. Can I use the, the vacation time that I'm going to accrue early so that I can do this? I don't think I've ever heard of any company that said no. Training. Will they pay for training? Training can be expensive. Will they pay for conferences? How many people are here on their own dime and how many people are getting paid by their company? <laughs> Quit trolling me. <laughs> if you're in a location where you have to pay for parking, such as a major city, how much is the parking going to cost you? Or does the company have parking spaces that you can use? Do they have their own parking? This is all going to factor in, especially if you've not worked in the city and you find out that you, you, know, you go for a job in the city and you get there and you take a look at your paycheck and on top of finding out that you're paying two, three hundred dollars a month for parking, what's this line item here? Oh, that's city tax. What? If you're not aware of that, it's gonna, it could cause you some problems. And as you're doing all this, when it's all said and done, especially if you're going for a new job, in writing. You walk away on a handshake and you think you understand it and they think they understand it and it turns out that either there's a miscommunication or maybe the person even overstepped their bounds and they offered you something that you can't, they can't actually offer you. <clears throat> when it's in writing, you know it's real. You know you can count on it. Now, that's not the right title on that slide. <laughs> Sorry about that. So, what I'm trying to get here is hack yourself and hack yourself first. Because when you present a positive attitude, they perceive you more positive. And things, the longer that goes on, it's like a feedback loop between you and the people around you. By hacking your environment, be aware of what's going on. Be aware of how what you're doing is impacting somebody else. If somebody walks up to you and you're at a, <coughs> in a queue and they kind of walk up behind you and you're typing away and you're talking to them with your back turned to them, that's not a positive experience for them. At the very least, turn around. Face them. If you can, get up and stand at their level because they came to you and to talk to you about something. So that's, you know, nobody likes a guy that's too arrogant to deal with you. Nobody likes a guy that whenever they walk up and talk to them, they end up talking to the back of your head. Use social engineering techniques. The stuff that I talked about is really just basic. That's some of the people out there. And this is for you, Chris. Social engineering does not require deception. It, is, it requires you to, to adjust the situation to look for the outcome that you want to have happen. It's a little bit, not quite as uh, in-depth as your definition there, Chris. And graphics here, that's all done by DigiP. I didn't do the music thing, so forget that. And that's the guy that did my bio photo. I'm running, well, I talk a lot faster when I have people in front of me. I was actually running over in all of everything that I did. Anybody got any questions? Yes, D Tom. Do you have any tips on um, hacking your wife or something along those lines? Yeah, well, I'm going to Yeah, I'm, uh, <laughs> okay. I fail every time. I don't know. That's, that's the point. <laughs> 
I'm just kidding. You're just kidding. You don't want me to answer that? Well, you got a good answer. I don't have anybody. Remember, you're being recorded. Yes, I know. I am no longer married. That's my disclaimer. But it's just like working with anybody else. Like I, like I mentioned, setting the frame. You don't start off with anything negative. You be positive. Talk about things. I'll give you a hypothetical scenario that doesn't have to do with a wife, but it's the same sort of techniques. Somebody, you know, you go to lunch with somebody and there's another person there that might be your child. You focus the talk on how this child has done in previous jobs. It doesn't have to be a small child, it could be a big child. And talk about that and go back and forth. And you're talking to somebody who works at a different company or something like that. And then you let the conversation wander on. And you do something like uh, go back to saying, well, you know, ask, ask this child, you know, you know anybody that happens to work at this place? Because this guy sounds like a really, you know, interesting place to work. And if you do it right, that person might turn around and ask that child if they want a job, hypothetically. Anything else or did I bore you? Yes, Chris. Why do they call you Dirty Uncle Lynn? <laughs> Not going there. <laughs> because it's your fault. <laughs> Anybody else who doesn't want to troll me? <laughs> yes, sir. As far as the uh, the whole determining your worth thing you were talking about, where's the way you can do that? Uh, that can be difficult depending on what you're doing. Uh, if you're talking about the industry that you're in, you want to look for salary studies. If you know anybody that is working in that and kind of get and they will give you any insight to how much money they're making doing that, or at least a range. You can also look at it, and it can be very greatly depending on the location. You may get one amount of pay in Louisville and a different amount in New York. If you're looking for a smaller company, they may pay differently than a larger company does. Anybody else? Yes, sir. Uh, both of you mentioned earlier, blank. Yes. Uh, by any chance you recall the author did that? Malcolm Gladwell. Malcolm Gladwell. Thank Gentleman you. right here got it. Yes, Chris. How do you handle the people that don't want to negotiate? There are going to be situations where somebody has something set and they're not going to budge or they don't want to budge. You will have more, you will have greater success in trying to make sure you present and frame things and keep things in a positive manner, you're not always going to be able to get your way or what you want. There are some people that are just not going to be, it could be the wrong time. They could have had, they could be the person that gets frustrated at things and they had a flat tire that morning and they're still angry about it. And unless you can get that to fuse, which is a lot more in depth than anything I talked about here, you're not going to be able to do anything, but you may actually get them to budge more than you realize they budged. Yes, sir? Uh, how do you handle it when the interaction is, say, over a phone line instead of in person? That's a very good question. Uh, first thing you want to do when you're dealing over a phone line there's a lot of psycho there's a lot of psychology the involved. In this. Oh, he wanted to know how it is done when you're dealing with it over a phone line rather than in person. Well, one of the things you want to do is if you like you say you're doing an interview, don't get up and do it in your pajamas. Because psychologically you're just lazing around the house in your pajamas. Get dressed up as if you were going to go to the interview. If you're unhappy, it's going to come across in your voice. If you're angry, it's going to come across in your voice. You know, and if you're smiling, it's going to come across in your voice. 
also. If you want to be considered more positive, stand up and talk as if you were in front of them standing up because even that is going to come across to you in your voice to a certain level and that's really all you've got going on with your voice because there is nothing else. Does that make sense? Yes sir. So uh, I have more of a, a comment rather than, I, I don't know if there's a question in here. Um, you mentioned previously that uh, throwing out like a ridiculous number is a, is a tactic that you can use in order to increase expectations. Um, and while that's true, I think it's important to remember that if you're trying to have a, a long-term relationship with someone such as a boss or a client, um, that can often cause negative feelings over the long term. So while you might get a higher price now in this transaction, they're gonna feel taken advantage of for future, for future transactions. And you're potentially damaging that relationship. Well, if you're gonna play hardball negotiations, there's gonna be potential that there's gonna be negative feelings. But I was looking more at throwing out this huge number kind of as an offhand joke and moving on. Now, I'm talking, you know, you throw out, you know, like a million dollars, but you're coming in, you're looking to get paid in the high tens of thousands of dollars, eighty, ninety thousand dollars. Sure. They know that you're not worth a million dollars, and you know that you're not going to get a million dollars. Does that make sense? Yeah. No. no I, I, again, I, it was more of a comment than a specific question. Um, it's just. There are certain negotiating tricks, right, that people often employ. And if the person you're negotiating with, one, knows what the tricks are, then they're going to be a little pissed off that you used it. And two, even if they don't, if they feel taken advantage of afterwards, that's bad. Yes. If it's a long-term relationship. That is bad. But then I've, I don't recall where, but there's been at least one study you know how you always have, you get you go someplace and you got the one person that's the suck up. And nobody can stand the suck up, not the people that are getting sucked up to or anything. They've done studies and they prove, they've proven, even though nobody can stand that person and it annoys the hell out of everybody, that that person does get some level of psychological advantage because they're sucking up. Even though it annoys the hell out of everybody. Which, based on that, that's my assumption that they do better when they suck up than when they don't. And they realize it, and that's why they continue to do it. Any other questions? Well, we got 15 minutes to get to closing ceremonies then, guys.